Hello, in this lecture I will talk about model and feature selection. Especially we are going to cover some of the more uh, interesting uh, algorithms for model selection and also for feature selection. And a key uh, point in these methods is uh, to apply cross-validation. At this point, you have already studied and implemented some algorithms for regression and other algorithms for classification. And you have had the opportunity to think of features uh, to select based on your intuition, which features would be uh, best uh, for a classification problem. In these uh, methods that we are going to see, uh, we are going to study a very uh, precise methods to be able to compare uh, between different pairs of models and sets of features and in order to select the, the optimal set of them or the, the optimal model. So let's start with uh, uh, models talking about models so suppose that uh, suppose that we are trying to select among several different models for a learning problem like uh, the, the first uh, simple model that we studied the polynomial um, could be for example a case of uh, regression or it could be also for classification and as you remember when you say i want to work with a polynomial at that time you are selecting a class of model but you still need to find the best uh, degree of this polynomial in this case the degree is k and as you have uh, experimented with during the exercises you need to run experiments with different degrees of polynomials and see which of these degrees is the best one for your problem, the one that could generalize well. So the question here is how can we automatically select a model that represents a good trade-off between bias and variance? So we want to select the best k, the best degree of the polynomial in such a way that our model is not uh, very uh, strict or with a lot of bias that cannot uh, learn the pattern in the data. And also we don't have, or we don't want to have a polynomial with a very large degree that uh, introduces a lot of variance in our model. So we want to avoid underfitting and also, we want to avoid overfitting. So how can we automatically select this? Another example in which we uh, would like to have a, a, an algorithm to, to select this model is, for example, suppose that you want to automatically choose the bandwidth parameter tau for the locally weighted regression, or maybe you want to estimate the best C parameter, which was uh, the trade-off uh, factor in super vector machine. Oh, so how, how can we do that? So we will assume that we have a set, a finite set of models. In this case, we are saying that uh, our set has D models. And we need or we want to run an algorithm that will allow us to uh, select the best model for our problem out of these d possible models so in this example mi some model mi may be uh, making reference to a polynomial of degree i uh, alternatively, if we're trying to decide between using support vector machine or a neural network or a logistic regression, 
then this set M of models will contain all the possible uh, models that we are considering. So once you have defined the set of models that you are going to compare in order to select the best one, uh, we need to uh, define a, a way to measure the performance of these models in order to try to detect or to find that model that will give you uh, the best generalization uh, performance. So we want to find this model that will uh, predict with a higher accuracy or the highest accuracy possible uh, the output uh, for new uh, examples, examples that are not in our training set. So what we do is, is called uh, cross-validation. In general, it is, it is called cross-validation and we will see that there are different ways to apply this cross-validation depending on the number of examples that we have available. So whether we have a small number of examples available or whether we have a large number of examples. So given a training set S, a possible empirical risk minimization, so the an algorithm for minimizing the error with this set, this training set, might look like the following one. First step, train each model MI on your dataset S to get some hypothesis HI. Okay. And then pick the hypothesis with the smallest training error. So uh, at first glance, it, it could look like a good idea to do this. But if you look at this algorithm, uh, more carefully, you will see that this is not a good idea actually. So the question why is not a good idea to do it like that? So if, if you uh, read carefully, it says train your model on your data set S and then you will select the model with the smallest training error. So the problem with this is that you can very easily overfit your model because in the case of polynomials, you can simply increase the number of terms of your polynomial. You can increase the, the degree of your polynomial. At, and at some point, you will manage to reduce the error with your training set. So this is not a good idea. Considering uh, choosing the order of the polynomial, the higher the order of the polynomial, then the better it will fit the training set and thus the lower the training error. So as I explained before, if you keep increasing the degree of the polynomial, uh, what you are going to get is that you are going to overfit your model. And of course, that is not good because the uh, generalization error is going to be very large. Therefore, this method will always select a high variance, high degree polynomial which we saw previously is often a poor choice. It leads to overfitting. So an, an algorithm that works better is what we call the hold out cross validation. In this algorithm, you split your data set S into uh, two subsets. One set called S train, for example, this subset will contain 70% of the available data in our set S. And the second subset will be SCV from cross validation. And this will contain the remaining 30% of the data. Here, the second subset SCV is called the holdout cross validation set. Once you have done that, in step two, you train each model MI on the subset train 
and you get some hypothesis H I and then you select an output the hypothesis H I that had this had the smallest error the uh, circumflex epsilon on the CV data so in this uh, smallest uh, set that it is used for testing so we recall that this circumflex epsilon denotes the empirical error or the error of generalization of a given hypothesis H in this case measured in this subset uh, cross-validation so the idea is that you use a set of examples to change or modify the parameters of your model you use this 70% of the data and you leave out the remaining 30% and this 30% you are never going to use it to make changes in the weights or parameters of your model you are going to use this uh, example only to see how good our hypothesis HI is predicting the output so by testing on a set of examples SCV that the models were not trained on we obtain a better estimate of each hypothesis HI's true generalization error and can then pick the one with the smallest estimated generalization error Usually somewhere between one fourth or one third of the data is used in the holdout cross validation set. And 30% is uh, a typical choice for uh, building these sets of training and cross validation. Optionally, in the step three in the algorithm, uh, you may also re uh, replace you may replace it by selecting the model MI according to uh, the argument that minimized the empirical error and then retrain MI on the entire training set so you can uh, use the algorithm to select which one of the hypotheses is, is the one with better generalization performance or, or smallest generalization error and then you retrain that hypothesis once that you have decided that this is the best one you retrain the hypothesis but now considering uh, the 100% of the training examples in an attempt to make it more robust now the disadvantage of using holdout cross-validation is that it wastes about 30% of the data so it is as if we were training a model using only 0.7 of the total uh, M training examples. Okay, so this is uh, could be considered a disadvantage. Um, well, this is fine if the data is abundant or it is cheap to generate. In learning problems in which data is scarce, we would like to do something. Uh, better okay so sometimes uh, the machine learning problems that we need to solve uh, has a, a lot of examples so you can uh, simply apply this hold out cross validation method you select like they say here 30% of the data you leave it as a test set and you train your model with the other remaining 70%. So if we are talking about having hundreds of thousands of examples, that, that is a good idea to do that. But if the data is not abundant, then there are other ways to apply cross-validation. And this is the like the, the most popular one or the most common way to apply cross validation. This is called k fold cross validation, and this is usually performed when you have maybe some thousands or ten or, th or thousands of examples. 
so you you don't have a large very large number of examples available so what, what you do is basically you repeat the whole out cross validation experiment k times and every time you run this algorithm you train and you test with different sets so that's why this algorithm is called k-fold cross-validation so the algorithm says st in step one randomly sp split your data set s of examples into k disjoint subsets of m over k training examples so suppose that you have you have uh, 1000 examples so m equals 1000 and you are going to run k uh, with k equals 10 so it will be 1000 over 10 so each disjoint subset will contain 100 examples each one of these subsets s1 to sk once you have done that for each model that you want to to compare the performance uh, we evaluate it as follows you run a loop from j equals 1 to k and you train the model mi on the set that results from the union of all the subsets that you created in the first step except here if you see here the union we don't have here the subset sj we go from sj minus one to sj plus one so we are missing here the sj and we are doing that because that subset is the one that we are going to use as our test set so you run this k times if you have uh, partition it your your set in in 10 uh, partitions then this will be applied 10 times so you will train on all the data except uh, the set the subset j and you will test the hypothesis on that specific uh, subset that you left out to get an estimation of the empirical error so the estimated generalization error of model MI is then calculated as the average of the uh, empirical error on uh, of this model average over J so in the third step you pick the model MI with the lowest estimated generalization error and retrain that model on the entire training set the resultant hypothesis is, the, is then output as our final answer so let's let's see this algorithm using a diagram which is more simpler to understand so suppose that we are going to use k equals 4 so we need to run our algorithm uh, four in four iterations so since our our k equals four then our data is also partitioned in four uh, subsets so here I, I am considering partition one two three and four so in the first iteration suppose that you leave partition 4 for testing you will train with the set uh, that will that will be created by the union of partition 1 2 and 3 so you train with this uh, first three partitions and you test how good your hypothesis is with partition 4 in this example suppose that the performance is 80 percent you go to iteration 2 and in this case I will train with partition 1, 2 and 4 so you will create one set with the union of these three partitions and once you have trained your, your hypothesis you test your hypothesis with the partition that we left out in this 
uh, iteration was partition three. And suppose that uh, the performance uh, for this is 90%. You go again and you train the same model now with partitions one, three, and four, and you test with partition two. Here I am assuming that the performance is 85. And in the last iteration, we train with partition two, three, and four, and we test with partition one. And suppose that we get a performance of 95. In the last step, what you need to do is to compute the average of performance from these four experiments. And in this particular example, we get that the mean or the average in the performance is 87.5%. So what you report in the end is that this model, uh, with this model, you, you expect to, to have a performance of 87.5% when you use this model to predict the outputs of new examples. Also, it is uh, a good idea to calculate the standard deviation. So for example, the mean here is 87.5, but there are some experiments in which the final performance was higher than 87, and also we had experiments like this first one that was below the mean performance was smaller than 87 so computing the standard deviation can also give you an idea of how much the final performance can differ or you would expect it to differ from the mean performance so uh, if you get Suppose that you have another model, a second model with this exactly the same mean performance, but with a standard deviation of, let's say, 1.5. Of course, you would prefer to use this second model because the standard deviation is smaller than 5. You will expect uh, less um, differences with respect to the mean performance. In general, a typical choice for this number of faults is 10. Now, if the training process is very time consuming, you can even run these experiments with K4. But as a standard, people usually try to run these 10 different uh, experiments because of course as as you increase the number of experiments the final estimation of the empirical error is going to be better this procedure may also be more computationally expensive than holdout cross validation since now we need to train each model k times while k equals 10 is a commonly used choice in problems in which data is really scarce, sometimes we will use the extreme choice of k equals n in order to leave out as little data as possible each time. So when we uh, run cross-validation with this uh, condition, this is an extreme case in which if we have, for example, 20 examples only, we run uh, k-fold validation with 20 uh, partitions. So in this case, what we are saying is we are going to train every time with every single example except one. And this one is, is uh, the one that you are going to use for testing the uh, models. And this, this method, this extreme method of cross-validation is called leave one out cross-validation. Now let's talk about feature selection, which is an important case of model selection. 
Uh, machine learning algorithms are known to degrade in performance. So the, the, the prediction accuracy can uh, go down when faced with many inputs, inputs that we call uh, usually features that are not necessary for predicting the desired output. So it could be the case that in a given machine learning problem, let's say a supervised learning problem for regression, and we have available a lot of data for each of the examples. So we have available maybe, I don't know, maybe 100 features, but it could be the case that many of these 100 features are not really related to the prediction problem that we want to solve. If we add these features that are not given important information for the problem, they, then what we can uh, be generating is a degradation of the performance of these models. So we would like to consider as less features as possible to select those features that are uh, given or that contain more information or important information for solving the prediction problem. In the feature selection problem, a learning algorithm is faced with the problem that of selecting some subset of features upon which to focus its attention while ignoring the rest. Now, the problem is, like for example, in bioinformatics, the number of features is very large, like in the, in the thousands. For example, in a typical cancer classification tasks, the number of variables could range from 6,000 to 60,000 when we consider the number of genes for which the, the expression is measured. So we can, we can have problems in which we have a, a very large number of features and we need to somehow select which features are, which, which subset of features is, is the best one for our problem. There are many potential benefits of feature selection. For example, facilitating data visualization and data understanding. So if you have uh, examples that are in dimension three and you can reduce that to dimension two, then it is easier to plot this as points in a plane. Or if you had points in dimension four, you can reduce that to dimension three and plot this as points in a 3D dimension. But starting from four, dimension four, then it is not possible to plot them in, in, in the corresponding dimension. So you need to take couples or um, thirds of, uh, groups of three dimensions of this uh, data so you can plot it at, at most in three dimension. So one, one uh, benefit of reducing the dimension by selecting less features is to be able to visualize them more easily. Another important point is to reduce the measurement and storage requirements. So if you have thousands of examples and each of these examples contain features, feature vectors of dimension, let's say 20, and you can reduce by selecting the best features, the best 10 features, you reduce the dimension from 20 to 10, then it will be easier to storage or to run any algorithm uh, on, this, on this set of examples. This is uh, very important nowadays that many of these data sets are in the cloud and then you need uh, sometimes to move these uh, examples from one server to another. So you want to reduce the amount of storage and the time needed for transferring this, this data. Another benefit is that uh, by reducing the number of features, you can reduce the training time. 
So it is not the same to train a model with input vectors of dimension uh, 50 than doing the same model training with uh, input vectors um, of dimension 10. So by reducing features, you also speed up the training of your models. And also you can cope with the course of dimensionality. The course of dimensionality uh, refers to the problem uh, of having an exponential growth in the number of uh, possible combinations of set of features as you increase the number of features. So every time you add one more feature, you are adding one dimension to your input uh, feature vector and then all the possible combinations that you can create uh, growth uh, exponentially and this is called the, the course of dimensionality so by reducing the feature uh, the features that you use you are uh, reducing this problem too now there are some drawbacks this, the search for for a subset of relevant features introduces an additional layer of complexity in the modeling task. So the search in the model hypothesis space is augmented by another dimension, the one of finding the optimal subset of relevant features. So when you worked with uh, the polynomial model for regression or for uh, logistic regression, you needed to run experiments with different degrees of polynomials and probably with also with different values of uh, the learning rate alpha and uh, in this case if you need also to run uh, experiments let's say using k-fold cross-validation you will need to run this experience for different subsets of features in order to find out which subset of features is, is the optimal for your problem so if you run cross validation for feature selection then this is another let's say parameter or set of parameters that you need to, to optimize so it increases the time needed for training models therefore you, you will need additional time for learning there are two types of or two families of feature selection algorithms uh, one of them is called wrapper methods these methods uh, assess subsets of variables according to their usefulness to a given predictor the method conducts a search for a good subset using the learning algorithm itself as part of the evaluation function so in this case, the problem boils down to a problem of a stochastic state space search. So the particular characteristic of this family of methods is that you, in general, you select a subset of features and you train your machine learning algorithm to uh, calculate or estimate the performance uh, for your model using the specific subset of features that you're using so you take as the part of the evaluation of this subset of each of these subsets of features the, the same problem that you are trying to solve your machine learning problem in the other uh, and we are going to see some of these methods but this is the characteristic part of wrapper methods the other family of methods are called filter methods and in in these filter methods you don't use your machine learning problem to try to ident identify the optimal subset of features they are considered pre-processing methods so they attempt to assess the merits of features from the data ignoring the effects 
of the selected feature subset on the performance of the learning algorithm. So examples are methods that select variables by ranking them through compression techniques, like for example, PCA, or clustering, like self-organizing maps, or k-means, or by computing correlation with the output. So in these methods, you don't use at all your, your uh, algorithm for regression or for classification. Well, you try to identify, given a set of features, you try to identify which features are more um, related to the final uh, label of your examples, whether this is for regression or for classification. So you define a function that will assign a score to each of the features and then you will simply select those features with better score. And we are also going to see different ways to assign these scores. Uh, but first, let's talk about uh, the first family of methods, the wrapper methods. So the, the pros on these kind of methods is the interaction between feature subset search and the model selection, so the machine learning problem, and the ability to take into account feature dependencies. So when you are using these uh, wrapper methods, since you are combining the, the selection of different subsets of features and the application of the, of the learning algorithm, then you can identify uh, if the features are really improving the uh, performance of the algorithm. Cons, uh, well, there's a higher risk of overfeeding than filter techniques and are very computational intensive, especially if building the classifier has a high computational cost. So this, this uh, risk of overfeeding, uh, of course, we can, we can try to minimize this when we are running uh, cross-validation. I think that here the most important uh, negative point of these methods is that they are computationally intensive because you would need to train your model with every subset of features. And if you, uh, as we're going to see later, if the set of features is large, then there are too many combinations of features that you can used to create your uh, subset of features and this is going to be very time consuming. So there are some strategies to avoid this uh, exponential, many of the times exponential number of combination of, of features. So the wrapper search can be seen as a search in a space W in the space of all the vectors of dimension n of zeros and ones. So suppose that n, you are talking about uh, five features. So n will be five. So this expression means all the possible vectors of zeros and ones of size five. Okay. So uh, any element of this set, which will be this small w, uh, any uh, uh, vector in this set in each of the positions, like in position J, uh, will contain a one if the input uh, J uh, does not belong to the feature set and it will contain a zero otherwise. So in this case, the, the coding is you will ha put a one if you don't want to consider feature J and you will point uh, a zero if you want to consider feature J, but it could be the other way around. Just mean that you will use zero and one to indicate which, which features you, you will uh, consider. So we look for the optimal vector W such that W will minimize, will be the argument that minimize the mean square error which is the generalization error of uh, the model based on the set of variables described by W. So the number of vectors in W 
is equal to 2 to the n so 2 because we can add the feature or not so it's 0 or 1 and n because it's the number of features available so if we had only three features for example uh, the total number of vectors in, in this set here will be 2 to the 3 which will be 8 8 possible vectors so if we would want to, uh, to run experiments exhaustive experiments to select which one of these uh, 8 possible vectors uh, is the best one we can do that in this case because we're talking only about 8 possible combinations of features but suppose that n is 100 then the number uh, of possible subsets is very large so as you increase the number of features the number of possible combinations increases exponentially for moderately large n the exhaustive search is no more possible so we need ways to cope with this problem